why don't we get started? Uh, Dr. Danford, could you give us a welcome? Sure. Uh, quickly, I want to uh, certainly say good, uh, good afternoon, good evening, and I want to welcome our city council members, those who have joined us. Uh, I want uh, Dr. Roger Kane to know how much we appreciate uh, the guidance that he's given us uh, over the last few weeks, uh, especially as it relates to providing uh, resources around this whole COVID issue uh, with uh, our underserved community. So I'm looking forward to the discussion. And again, the Urban League, uh, uh, it continues to work in providing community engagement around a number of issues impacting our community. So again, welcome and we look forward to a lively discussion. Well, thank you, Dr. Danford, and thank you very much for your support of the Center for Advocacy and Social Justice and these, these webinars uh, and town hall meetings. Uh, we have been working now for about a year and a half on closing gaps, and uh, it's, been, it's been a major focus of ours to focus on public health, and we've been able to connect up with uh, the population Consortium and Dr. Kane, and um, and with that, I'm going to turn it over to Kazaya, who is going to be our moderator. Hello, everyone. Um, my name is Kazaya, and I'm the Social Justice Intern Coordinator with the Center for Advocacy and Social Justice. Um, and I'll just be kind of running, you know, just going in between people tonight. Uh, so first, we just wanted to start off with uh, Dr. Rogers Kane, who is the former president of the Northeast Florida Medical Society. Um, and he'll be going over some data surrounding COVID and its role in identifying coexisting health disparities in Jacksonville and Duval County. Okay, dokie. Good evening, everyone. Um, uh, as she said, I'm Dr. Rogers Kane. I've been in Jacksonville for greater than 30 plus years. I've also uh, been president of Northeast Florida Medical Society, which is a, a Black Physicians Medical Society. Mm -hmm. uh, I've also have, I am currently president of the Northeast Florida Medical Society Foundation. I've done whatever uh, amount of things that I've tried to do uh, in my uh uh, and, and as far as my employment history is concerned. The main thing though is, is that I've been a community advocate uh, for those 30 years that I've been here, working hard. Uh, most of the time I try to stay in the, back, uh, in the background. I'm not one of those people that like to be in the foreground, uh, but I'm always advocating for the proper, um, uh, for, for proper treatment. And um, uh, as it relates to the minority community, and so uh, when Richard and Dennis asked me to uh, step up this evening and just kind of give a basic uh, quick presentation on COVID and where do we go from here basically is what it's gonna be about. Uh, what do we do after COVID? Um, and in particular, what are we going to do with the next pandemic? Cause there will be another one. Uh, and uh, so my intent is to address the underlying issue that, 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 that we contend made COVID as bad as it did, so that if we can address those issues, uh, as bad as it is, uh, if we can address those issues now, maybe the next pandemic that comes along, and again, I anticipate that we will be another one or some other issues that come along for sure, uh, maybe we can go on ahead and uh, do a, um, get ahead of the, 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 the get ahead of this, um, the next pandemic and not and not have as much of morbidity or or sickness and death as we had with this one. So if we can uh, put up the slides, I promise I won't take long with it. It looks long, but it's more of a um, uh, it just looks that long. I go through them rather quickly. So you know what we really want to talk about is um, ultimately, as I said, the COVID nineteen virus and what it has unveiled when we peel back that onion peel layer, but what it has unveiled in terms of the health disparities of the black population. That has been there. These are the underlying issues associated with COVID and we've been there for a long time. Next slide, please. It was about a year ago today that the World Health Organization 
uh, uh, actually declare that we were having a fast spreading coronavirus uh, that was uh, that caused a pandemic next. Uh, and about a year ago, we heard a whole lot of things as it relates to this pandemic. Um, well, we'll be locked down for two weeks. Um, I won't say who the authors are, but <laughs> you can't pass on COVID if you don't have any symptoms. Um, masks don't work. It's just a flu. It's no worse than a cold. Next slide, please. And COVID timeline. The, the most prominent thing I wanted to mention here is it was December 31st, 2019, that China alerted the World Health Organization of several cases of unusual, unusual pneumonia in Wuhan, China. Next. Well, Jeff, that, that those birds sound good. Uh, also, <laughs> okay, the, um, the most prominent thing I wanna mention on this slide is, uh, it's getting there, uh, if I could speed it up. <laughs> on February 11th, the World Health Organization announced that the, the name of this new coronavirus will be called COVID-19. Next slide. And then approximately a week later, uh, the CDC warned us that that COVID-19 virus could be pretty severe. And it asked us, uh, it, it, it mentioned that we expect that to be spreading significantly throughout the community uh, uh, of the US. Next slide. And then of course, March 11th, uh, several weeks later, World Health Organization uh, officially uh, crowned this as a pandemic. Next slide. And a year later, here's what some of the numbers that we're looking at. Healthcare workers worldwide uh, are, uh, have died, about 3,000 plus healthcare workers have died worldwide. Healthcare workers, we do not expect to die. We are expecting to help keep people from dying. Uh, when you look at the cases worldwide, we had about 118 million uh, cases, uh, 29, 29 million of those, about a quarter of them were US cases. Uh, as, as far as it relates to death, 2.6 million, and about a fifth of those, 529,000, were death located in the United States. Next slide. On March 17th of uh, uh, today, we, those numbers have upped a little bit, went uh, to one, uh, 120 million, 1.2 million, all the way to 1.21 million uh, worldwide, and uh, US 29.5 million, as well as uh, there are 536, 537 deaths in the US for all intents and purposes. Next slide. In Duval County, we had about, uh, uh, at this point in time, we got about 89,000, uh, had 89,000 residents that were positive. About 1,488 of them were non-Duval residents. We've had over 2,000 hospitalizations, a lot of money. Those hospitalizations last a long time, cost a lot of money. And the number of deaths uh, have been at 1,247. Money is not the issue, particularly when you're dying. Uh, and the median age for the, the uh, people that have been infected is about 38 years of age. This is going to be important in a future slide. Next slide, please. Currently, African Americans make up about 30.5% of Duval County's population in the latest census. The, um, uh, the Hispanic uh, population is about 10.5%. Add those numbers up, we're representing about 41% of Duval County's population. And we are people of color are the most affected as it relates to this virus. Next slide, please. I brought this in to show where this virus is, uh, has significantly hit hard, not uh, hit hardest pro uh, in all pro probability. Um, and I wanted to highlight those zip codes that are there um, that's in the HEP Zone 1. HEP Zone 1 is 32202, 4, 6, 8, 54, and 9. Uh, but in the close proximity of that is 32218 as well. Next slide, please. 
with that, it shows that place matters. Uh, where you locate it is matters. Help zone one uh, it has a significantly uh, a significant part of the population are African Americans. It represents about seventy six percent of the uh, residents living in Help Zone One. They also the median income, as I mentioned uh, before, but the median income there is about twenty six thousand, which is below the poverty level. Next slide, please. African Americans have been very disproportionately uh, of, uh, impoverished as far as Duval County is concerned. Uh, and then you will see also that they have, they have very, been very disproportionately affected as far as this virus is concerned. So there will be a connection there. There is a connection there. Uh, we do represent um, uh, about at least about 5,000 plus in terms of the numbers as far as our Caucasian counterparts. But again, that's a, that is very significant when, it, when they represent close to 60% and we're representing closer to um, uh, 30%. Next slide, please. What we also see is that African-Americans also represent a significant portion of people that are underinsured in Duval County. If you see, Hispanic and Latino uh, have the highest number of uninsured, but closely behind is African-Americans at 17.3%. Uninsured, uh, well, um, if you look at percentage-wise, I'm sorry, go percentage-wise, it would be American uh, Native Indians, Alaskan Indians uh, are, are the greatest uh, uninsured. However, in terms of numbers, um, you look at African-Americans being the greater in terms of numbers. Um, in terms of disproportionate numbers. The, um, the number of residents in Duval County who are uninsured about 104,000. Um, that is what we see is that um, that uninsured spike rate, uh, uninsured rate spiked up during this pandemic. And so now we have about one in four Floridians under the age of 65 that are uninsured uh, due to job loss during this pandemic. Next slide, please. Health disparities, okay, official definition, differences in incidence, prevalence, mortality, and burden of diseases, and other adverse health con conditions that exist among specific population. So it's the difference between the kind of uh, health-related uh, service, uh, health-related effect that I have versus those that Jeff may have. Uh, health equity is the treatment that different between what Jeff may get and what I may get. And it refers to all groups in the population having equal, fair, and just opportunities to attain their full health and well-being potential and quality of life. Next slide. What COVID-19 did, again, as I said before, peel back that onion skin, that onion peel on these um, inequities, these racial and health, uh, uh, racial and eth ethnic health inequities and that have been undermining our sense of communities and healthcare system from the beginning. As far as back as we can, 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 can go, that, that has existed. The inequities of an unfair treatment as it relates to health and, and ethnic populations. Uh, the black population are more likely to suffer from health conditions uh, and they're more likely to be sicker, have serious complications and more likely to die from them and more likely to get uh, 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 worse treatment. Next slide, please. The CDC, uh, what they, you know, the people that are high risk for COVID um, nineteen related complications. They are they outline those people who are more likely to have issues, or more uh, uh, um, who are more likely to be affected by COVID, and to the to the greater degree by COVID because of, of the uh, concurrent or uh, comorbid serious underlying health condition. Those include cancer, kidney disease, COPD, heart conditions, uh, immunocompromised patients, obesity, very prevalent in our community, severe obesity also prevalent in our community, pregnancy, sickle cell disease, smoking and diabetes. Next slide, please. This slide can almost overlap that previous slide if you start looking at the, uh, the most prevalent uh, disease that, uh, of concern. So of all causes, you can see the numbers on that, but my, 
I, my, my, the, the point I'm really trying to get across are these same items that the CDC listed as being the, um, uh, the, the most, the, the comorbid conditions that can cause, have the worst outcome with, with uh, COVID-19. Again, cancer, heart disease, stroke, uh, chronic respiratory illnesses, diabetes, kidney disease, uh, and high blood pressure. Uh, if I probably went on down the list, the rest of the, what, what we saw on that previous list would also be listed, but I only went to the five, five, uh, six or seven. Next slide, please. They even went to the, uh, if we look at what our governor says, what he published as of March 15th, he also enumerated on those people who uh, have been determined by their physicians to be more, the most extremely vulnerable to COVID-19. The problem that I have with this, I mean, I agree with the more, one's most extremely vulnerable because that is the definition of the previous two slides that I just showed you. The problem I have with this is that the vaccinations and who eligible for it has been based more on age than it has been these core morbidities. And the difficulty of those people who have had the comorbidities have in terms of receiving the vaccine, needing a certificate from the uh, physicians, you know, that's not really that, uh, that good because they, the physicians may not um, see that patient for two weeks. Some of these physicians offices have a backlog of appointments of two weeks. Um, the patient would have to pay to go see a physician uh, because the physicians in the business make money and that may be what they're gonna do. Uh, in order to get that certificate or, or in order to get that note to get vaccinated. I think that's just an unnecessary hurdle for us to have for people to be properly vaccinated. I've had patients come to me and that's what they want me to do for them and I do it because they have those comorbid conditions. There are other states where they can attest, just attest to the fact that they have asthma or they have diabetes and that's good enough uh, regardless of their age and they get the vaccine. Next slide, please. And when you use age as one of these factors by which the determine the diagnose to diagnose, uh, I'm sorry, to, to vaccinate people, um, there's a big problem with that as it relates to Duval County. This chart just basically shows that the, the majority, I mean, the people that are over 65 uh, constitute 136,000 out of 971,000 uh, people in Duval County. If you also look at the um, so that will be that the uh, you add up the population of those between 18 and 64 and those under 18, you got the overwhelming majority of the population that um, uh, are, 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 that are at risk for having this disease, not at the with the most severe outcome, but are at risk. Now that population, my the the point that I'm trying to get across, that population usually consists of those essential workers, those people who got to go to work every day. Uh, and, and in particular, those people who don't have, particularly ones that we mentioned before, those that are in the uh, uh, um, below poverty level and may be working or not working, but most of the time, many of them are working. These days you can work two jobs and still be below poverty level. Those individuals are the ones who wind up getting this disease and taking it home to the grandparents. The grandparents, especially in my practice, they've done everything they need to do to keep from getting COVID. They wear their masks, they social distances. A lot of them were ordering their food. The kids were bringing their food. They were not going outside. They tried everything they could to keep from getting this disease. But it's the kids or the grandkids that come over to visit grandma because they hadn't seen them in a while or for whatever reason, bring these disease, bring this disease into these multi-generational household, which we have a lot of in the zip code and as uh, zip codes in health zone one uh, that we have a lot of, they bring that to their parents or grandparents. They don't have a choice like I do where I could work from behind a computer and, mo and most of the people on this call can work from behind a computer. They don't have that choice. They are the essential workers. They got to go to work whether they're a waiter, whether they're the janitor or whatever it is that they do. Technically, they can be a, a, a bus driver. City bus driver still has to go, has to go to work. Otherwise, the bus stop working or stop running. So uh, my point to this whole slide is I'm, I'm, I'm a little bit concerned that maybe we targeted the wrong population as to who should get that vaccination first. 
Um, I understand maybe the rationale why some people did it, but that's just my contention. Uh, next slide, please. Real quick, the, the zip codes in Duval County, uh, uh, I told you it was two, four, six, eight, uh, nine, and 54 in HEP Zone 1. Just give me a real quick overview of these um, uh, zip codes. And two, that was 1998. Next slide. Six, 1457. Next, eight, 3,745. Uh, 9, 3,027, next slide, 54, 1,185, and uh, 4, we had uh, uh, 1,020, next slide. And while this is not the within HEF Zone 1 officially, they are, it, it, it abuts HEF Zone 1. We had 6,300, just around 6,400 cases of of uh, COVID in that zip code. Now, when you put all those together, that is right in that health zone one area, lots of cases, um, and they all kind of butt one another. You can go beyond health zone one, those cases that might be abutting the, the uh, areas of, as far as health zone one is concerned, but they're abutting that area. So, I mean, you know, pick up a rock, throw it across the street, maybe in, health, in a different health zone, health zone five. Uh, but they're close to the health zone one. And those guys have a uh, high, um, uh, high uh, low, they in, uh, low income, uh, medium income, low medium income. And they're also high as, it, as far as it relates to the affliction of, with our COVID-19 virus. Next slide, please. So this is, I put this slide in because uh, it reminds me of when we had our younger kids and we're headed to Disney World and that what got on my nerve the most was they kept asking, you know, when are we going to get there? Are we there yet? Well, what this represents is Dr. Fauci is trying to get us to, to what the pre-COVID-19 normal. And we keep asking the question, many, you know, whether it's community, whether it's the professional community, we're asking that same question. Are we there yet? Are we there yet? You know, and the answer obviously is no. We have a long way to go. I, I don't want people to get the false sense of security that because the vaccine or several vaccines are here and because we've come up with a whole vaccination site by which uh, uh, we also know that there hasn't been a, the level of turnout that we want because of vaccine hesitancy. That's something that we need to address. Uh, that we are not near normal yet. We got a long way to go and we do not need to let our guard down. Otherwise, we're gonna be right back in the position that you see in some of these other European countries are doing right now. They hitting another third round of COVID and we don't want that third round. We don't want another shutdown, but what choice will we have if we allow these variants to develop, if we allow, uh, we don't, if we didn't learn anything at this point as to the mistakes we may have made. And, and, and again, if we don't get people vaccinated. Next slide, please. So the question is, how do we reduce these racial and, health and ethnic health inequities? Because these, again, were the underlying issues that allowed COVID to develop to the degree that it did and to kill the number of people that it did, as well as the incompetency in terms of our administration. My opinion, doesn't have to be everybody else's, but that level of incompetency and our underlying health conditions or the incompetency about our underlying health conditions um, uh, allowed this virus to be as bad as, as what it is. Um, and I'm gonna say it's what it is. I don't wanna say it's what it was because that implies that it's over. So to help to, to, to not put ourselves in this position again. We've got to work together, improve our healthcare system, make it a highly quality, uh, uh, high quality, comprehensive, affordable, and make it accessible to everyone. Accessibility is significant because as you saw in one of the slides was that we do not have, a lot of people are uninsured. They're using the emergency room as their doctor, okay? Or they may have, if they have access to a doctor, it may be delayed 
And in this case, it's critical when you can get delayed access to that doctor because either because you're significantly ill and got to go to the emergency room or you can't get that vaccine because that doctor is not available to sign you off on being able to get the vaccine. And with that, I will turn it back over to, uh, to Zaya and let her proceed. Thank you so much for that presentation, Dr. Kane. Um, next, we'll be having Dr. Goldhagen speak. Um, and we hope that he'll speak a bit on uh, health disparities currently um, and the vaccines and also kind of the history of that and what we can do now, I guess, to kind of remedy the disparities. Um, yes, and a little bit about uh, Dr. Goldhagen. Um, he's a former uh, Duval County Health Department director and um, he is also a pediatrician. Great. Well, I appreciate the um, the short introduction, and uh, most of the people on the on the uh, Zoom meeting tonight, uh, you know, whether it's five years, ten years, fifteen, twenty, not quite thirty, but many of you uh, go go back uh, twenty five plus years, and in particular, my my colleagues and Kim and Kelly and and Rogers. I, you know, my wife this morning asked me. Why couldn't I be like more like Dr. Fauci? <laughs> he said, "Why are you always angry? You know why? Wh why? Uh, you could accomplish more if you were like Dr. Fauci." Well, unfortunately, I'm not like Dr. Fauci, uh, and I am angry uh, because, as um, as Roger said, uh, this uh, in one of his slides, this is not about unearthing inequities. This is about amplifying them and um, uh, a lens through which we can see the inequities that have existed and that we've known have, have existed. Meanwhile, in the, in the context of all this, um, and I'm just gonna be honest and transparent, uh, our, uh, our state government has dismantled public health uh, statewide, uh, and that has translated in dismantling public health uh, locally. And as a result, when this pandemic hit, we were not uh, prepared to address it. And through this process of dismantling, we're, we're, we've lost whatever capacity we've had in the past, or it's going to greatly diminish their ability to address the uh, disparities that exist, uh, health disparities and inequities that exist in our community. Uh, in the context of that, we do know how to address these disparities. Uh, what we lack is the uh, political commitment to actually make that happen. Um, and, um, you know, the example that COVID provided us, uh, we didn't see the health department director because we don't have a health department director uh, presenting. We had no uh, expertise uh, present during this whole process. We heard from the mayor, which was great in the sense that he had the courage to suggest that um, we wear masks, but there was virtually no expertise, no public health expertise, no medical expertise, no context that provided any sort of capacity for us to apply an evidence base to address COVID-19. Uh, COVID As a result, we have tens of thousands of people um, who have come down with disease, thousands of people in our, in our community that have died from the disease. And what we're left here right now, I would say, is an opportunity. And that is uh, the opportunity to learn from this epidemic or this pandemic. And if we lose that opportunity, um, then the deaths and the suffering and the mortality and the morbidity have been for, uh, for naught. Um, in that context, Rogers and I, um, you know, uh, close friends, colleagues, working together for decades here, um, just sort of had a joint epiphany. And I think that's legal, but I'm not 100% sure. But we had a joint epiphany and said, you know, we have phenomenal medical societies and organizations and health organizations in the community. Why don't we bring them all together to form what we're calling now the Population Health Consortium, um, and together take that experience and that IQ and that knowledge and expertise, pool it, and then serve as a resource for the entire community. Uh, and in that group are the Medical Society, the Northeast Florida Medical Society, the 
Black Nurses Group, the Hispanic uh, Medical Society, the Filipino Medical Society, um, and um, the uh, Planning Council, Health Planning Council, and the Partnership for Child Health. And so the idea was to bring all of these resources together to form a population health consortium that, you know, quite frankly, can, we can't replace the health department. And we're not suggesting we're gonna, going to replace the health department. But what we are suggesting is that this resource um, as, a, as a sustainable resource can work with the community in particular um, with our city council and the mayor's office and so on and so forth to provide the expertise and the experience uh, to address population health issues COVID-19 obviously being a critical one. Uh, we're also beginning to work on hunger and, and uh, childhood hunger with the, with the Northeast Florida, uh, with feeding Northeast Florida and so on. So what um, I'm here tonight uh, was to plead with those uh, uh, on, this, on, the, on the meeting tonight who are in leadership positions um, and I've known you all for for many, many years um, to work with us as a population health consor uh, council consortium. Um, and Urban League is a, um, is a charter member of it uh, to allow, allow us to work with you to address the um, COVID priority, number one, but other health disparities that currently exist and will exist in the future to provide that reservoir of knowledge and expertise to allow us to, uh, to, 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 to address these issues in our, in our community, which we, share, which we share with you. The frustration has been, uh, and you can hear the frustration in my voice, is that we can respond to this. We could have responded to this from day one, um, but no, uh, there was no public health per expertise in the community that was allowed to uh, do that because we no longer have a Duval County Health Department. We have a um, Florida Health Department in Duval. And as that Florida Health Department has been dismantled statewide, uh, that has trickled down to us. So in a sense, and I'll finish here, in a sense, our, um, um, our community needs to understand that it cannot look to the Department of Health, uh, State Department of Health to address critical issues in our community. We are gonna have to do it internally and thus creating the Population Health Consortium of Northeast Florida to provide the expertise and resources uh, to be able to work with our leadership, political leadership, uh, in order to be able to address the issues that we know how to address. Um, so I'm gonna stop there. I'm gonna have to break a little early um, for family medical issues, but, um, uh, but let me also finish by thanking you all, those of you I've worked with over the decades for your perseverance, for your knowledge, expertise, and uh, for doing, always operating in what's in the best interests of our, of our community. And so I'm thinking Dr. Fauci, I'm trying to channel Dr. Fauci and it's not working. It's just not working. Yeah. You don't look as good as Fauci. You yeah, I don't know. <laughs> and he's 80 years old. We should all look as good as Dr. Fauci when we're 80. Yeah, I'm telling you now. Yeah. Thank you. We're working, on, we're working on it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, really thanks for all you guys. Oh, we, we, we appreciate all the work you've done, uh, Dr. Goldhagen. And Jeff, please. It's a pleasure to work with you. So, Kaziah, back to you. Yes. Uh, next on the agenda, we have some pre-prepared questions um, written by one of our interns um, in cons consultation with some of the Black health professionals. Um, so, Ane, if you want to take that over. Hey, y'all. Okay. So, the series, of, I have about six questions here. Um, the first one reads, equity for the COVID-19 vaccination has been a highly publicized issue across the nation. Some responses taken include vaccinations via zip codes to create a more equitable response. What deliberate steps has the city done or will do to alleviate the racial disparities among the COVID-19 vaccine? You want, 
You want me to address that from the city standpoint? Go ahead, yes. Well, I, uh, this is uh, Councilman Salem. I, I'm a pharmacist for you, y'all that don't know that and have been uh, engaged in the COVID situation from the very beginning uh, because my uh, the pharmacy that I work for serves nursing homes. So we have been um, on the front end of this. I think the, the issue with the COVID, uh, COVID vaccine was the supply early on the process. And I know from my standpoint, um, I'm an at-large councilman and my residency area is the Arlington Beaches area. And uh, everybody wanted uh, their own vaccination site. The beaches wanted a site, the Northwest area wanted a site. Everybody was looking for a site. And we had limited vaccine. And, and then um, we eventually got more vaccine. Was, and we got the gateway site. We got the other water site. We now have a site at the beach. It, 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 was, fr it was frustrating to many of us to, uh, to get the vaccine out. Um, I hope as we move forward with this process and we look at the way we administered vaccine, I know I've read about West Virginia that purely went with an age uh, factor. If you were 65 and over, it didn't matter where you worked, what you did, police officer, healthcare worker, it didn't matter. If you were over 65, you got a vaccine first and they were able to, to get vaccine out to their populations much quicker than many other states. So I hope as we move forward, we look at best practices that occurred across the country and what was the most effective way, because I, I agree with uh, Dr. Kane, I think this will happen again, probably in our lifetimes, and we need to be better prepared. In terms of some of the racial disparities, I think the council is, uh, is very open and has been in terms of trying to be a partner to try to expand opportunities to those that don't have health insurance. I know uh, personally myself, I. I obtained funding for volunteers in medicine to expand over uh, into uh, 32210. Um, we are funding now this computer system, which will allow all the healthcare groups that provide healthcare services to the poor throughout the community to talk to each other. And that should coordinate services a lot better. I, I don't think government can do everything, but I think government should be playing a role and trying to expand uh, primary care in, in particular to all parts of our community so that, that residents do not have to go to an emergency room to get primary care. None of us want that to occur. And, and I think we're gradually moving in that direction, never as quick as we would want to, but I, I think we're making significant progress. Okay, thank you. Uh, would any other council member like to address? Sure, I would. Um, council member Morgan, District 1. I am actually Ron Salem's council member, and he is actually my at-large council member. How about that? Um, thanks for having us tonight uh, to talk about a very important subject. I, I like to talk about Edward Waters College and um, the site that I went to to get my COVID vaccine, and that is Gateway. Both of those were very busy sites, but I have to say that Gateway continues to say that they simply are not using their vaccine. So for me, I have to go um, kind of what Dr. Kane talked about at one of the other seminars that I saw him speaking at, and that's the fact that they're still a lot of misinformation, disinformation that's out there. And there are still people who actually get the vaccine that simply will not get it. And so for me, I would like to know how we um, achieve that. The city has been working with our sites uh, in conjunction with the state and the feds. So as we open these sites across the city and have this access for our citizens, how do we get the citizens to actually come to the site? 
that's where I would like to focus. I also have a site in Regency Square Mall, which is a wonderful site because you can get tested there or you can get vaccinated there. So we have double options at, um, at sites like Regency. So for me as a council member, that's what I'm looking for. I'm looking for how we get more of the people who qualify right now to get out there and get vaccinated. Okay. Uh, can I jump in just for a second and just, Please. if I could, one of the things that I think that we are doing for the first time is taking advantage of our pharmacies. Um, we've got vaccines in, in, uh, uh, in pharmacies all over this community. We've got pharmacists that are trained to provide vaccines. And, and I think for the first time, we're taking advantage of my profession. And I think those are often neighborhood pharmacies that people can get into and get their vaccines. So thank you for letting me jump in and say that. Uh, let me uh, just mention a couple of things. Uh, I too am, a, uh, I've trained in pharmacy first, Florida a University, I've worked about five years. So I am very familiar with pharmacy. And that was one of the things that we've been advocating in terms of making sure that pharmacies, uh, particularly community pharmacies, those located in the communities uh, have access to the vaccine, not a Publix for which there was no Publix in, our, in the, uh, that, the, the, the health zone one, there was no Publix there with pharmacies. You right. know, one Publix, but <clears throat> none with pharmacies. So the rollout for that would, you know, fell, fell flat. The other thing is, uh, as it addresses in terms of primary care, I think one of the things that um, is missing when Jeff made mention of the health department, the health department, uh, we call it the health department. I know now they wanted to call it the Department of Health because they going for, you know, they pretty much is a state run. And uh, I'm almost ready to say state located, even though it's over there on 6th Street, um, a state run organization. We don't have anything locally. They took away primary care, which was the safety net for many of the, uh, uh, the underserved in this community. That was a big safety net. And when that got defunded or underfunded, um, it took away a lot. What also happens though, is that then those people wind up going to emergency room and a, a, a significant portion of them going to University of Florida, Shands, as some of us know, UF Health, as others know, um, a lot of them go there. I know the cities has to take, it gives a lot of those funds to UF Health and they're asking and sometimes asking for more and more funds. And I'm not sure how well they're being used. Not that UF Health is misusing it, but we're basically do, giving tertiary care for something that should be more primary. So we should be more out on the front line. You put the dollars up ahead to prevent using more dollars behind you. And that affects the city budget and how well the, the city uh, residents are being taken care of. The other thing in, in addressing, um, and so that, that uh, uh, goes to access to health and then addressing what uh, Ms. Morgan and Councilman Morgan uh, relates is how do we get more people there to these vaccination sites? I would agree that initially vaccines were, were uh, or the, the number of availability of vaccine was a significant issue. Um, and the availability of vaccine sites were a significant issue. We advocated making sure that when the vaccine became more available, that they became more localized in communities because that grandmother that they really were advocating, they were pushing very hard for those 65 and older, getting somebody's grandmother, grandfather, they were advocating very hard for those want to be the ones to, to get the vaccine initially, but they had no way of getting to the Regency Mall. It was too distant for them. You was over there in my neck of the woods and have zone one. That was probably 12, 15 mile uh, drive, ride. They're afraid to go across these bridges. Their kids would have to take off from work to try to get them there. And so luckily so far, uh, and, and thanks to the effort of organizations like the Urban League and the NAACP and the uh, Florida and University of, uh, School of Pharmacy and the Black Nurses and Northeast Florida Medical Center, luckily we've gotten a lot more places available. The problem is 
we don't have the messaging there. Uh, there is being a lot of misunderstanding, miscommunications as to uh, who's available because we keep getting so much, I, I, for lack of a better description, somebody put it well, rain dropping in terms of who is available to the vaccine this day and then two, two days later, somebody else is available. And then they get a missed message when they look at a national news and somebody says, oh, 18 and older can get the vaccine. And they might have been talking Alaska, but that's all they caught on WJCT <laughs> or some of the other uh, uh, news stations. That's all they heard was 18 and older. And then they show up at these vaccination sites and then they're turned away. Of course, they get a sour taste in their mouth and they go and talk to their friends and tell them what happened. So messaging is important and we need to have more messengers that look like us. And it doesn't mean me, it means, you know, go for the black media, the black newspaper, go for those items where, where black folk look and listen uh, quite a bit and reach out to them because not all of them look at national news or even local news on TV. I digress. Yeah. I, wanted to, I wanted to add on, um, I am um, Kim Barbell Johnson, family physician by training um, in this community for 25 years and have raised both my children in this town, um, have been on the clinical research trial area for the last 15 years or so uh, with primary care, but has lived and have been committed to this community and to public health ever since uh, Jeff Goldhagen knocked on my door when I was a new doctor at Mayo Clinic and said, would you like to come and help me out at the homeless shelter? And I said, yes, and have never looked back. This commitment that we have or the lack of commitment that we, that we seem to have um, and sustainability to kind of get over the hump of health disparities. We call it Healthy People 2010 and Healthy People 2020. We've been asking um, this community to come together, to rally together the professional side, the political side, the social side, uh, to join for social justice reform so that we can help patients who are, who are carrying the burden of the diseases that we've talked about. And now we have COVID just mere, uh, glorifying these issues. My point is that not only do we have a long history that we have sent messages that sometimes have fallen flat on our community, but we've sent messages or made promises that haven't been delivered. The, a lot of our community does not deserve our trust because we have not delivered to um, many members of our community the things that we've said that we cared about. And even though we've been trying and trying our hardest to deliver because it hasn't been delivered because they've seen no physical change, our community number, the burden of disease has not changed pre-COVID. It's hard to trust us. It's hard to trust you. It's hard to trust me. In addition to that message that we're sending, I think that one of the biggest things that I've seen in this COVID space is the inadvertent message that this community of leaders has sent, whether it was intentional or not intentional. We have had vaccines developed, uh, distributed, manufactured in a very short period of time. We've glorified that. We've gotten every black and brown person that I know personally to get on every airway to talk about why we should trust that. And we said, it's hard, but we did it. But what do we say to the people in our town? We say that we thought about you as an afterthought because we knew vaccines were coming. There was a guidebook. We sent it to every doctor, including Dr. Barbell Johnson, who read it page to page in October, who bought a refrigerator that's not being used because we have no vaccine for that refrigerator, but who did everything our leaders asked us to do to get ready for COVID vaccine. And that refrigerator stays empty with no vaccine from the state because this hasn't been delivered yet. It's ordered, but not delivered. And while I'm glad that the community is a rich community back for vaccines, and I'm glad that Dr. Kane and I have been on this trail since October, talking about either getting ready for the vaccine or why the vaccines are safe. Unfortunately, I'm extremely disappointed in, to live in a city and to live in a state that the distribution has been so horribly mismanaged. And I don't understand how we continue to ask people to think that they're important, that we think that they're important when, we, when they're the afterthought. We got, we got a vaccine distribution site and then we thought about the black people. Then we thought about adding Edward Waters College. Then we thought about adding Gateway. Why, were they, why was that not a primary thought? And if we use the excuse that because our governor 
said, let's look at the epidemiology of this. Let's look at those who are dying from COVID. And if our governor says 85% uh, of the deaths are due to people who are over 65, let's start with age, fine. But the reason that the federal government allowed for the states to manage this is because we know that we have the ability as states to tweak these policies and to tweak what we need for our community. The social determinants of health and the social um, indices that the CDC also supports says black and brown people are dying from COVID independent of age. We could have actually as a city said, black and brown, come on. You want a vaccine? Come get a vaccine because black and brown people are dying of, of COVID-19. We chose not to do that. And black and brown people heard that and we're seeing that. So now those of us who have spring breakers in St. John's County, but here I am sitting at my dining room. Um, those of us who are continuing to stay here because it's that important, stay here on the grind. We just need to one, have a voice for this, for this story to be understood comprehensively. Number two, to understand for us to under, help, for us to understand that you understand that the messages, not only are they sometimes impotent, sometimes they're well intended, but you also have a lot of unintended messages that you're sending. And those unintended messages are sometimes louder than the ones that we are sending. And that just makes our job so much harder. So um, that's my point on uh, or my response to the question. And, and if there's anything that I could do to, as an advocate, it would just say to just be, be aware of the unintended messages that we're sending as leaders and as a community. I just have one other thing to add because uh, as like Kim, we've been very passionate about this. Now, I think where I was somewhat disappointed, to be quite frank with you, is our community looked to our community leaders to step up and provide them with either answers and or with suggestion or advice or leadership in terms of, of what to do. And I, I, I regretfully, and you know, uh, without, uh, at the risk of, of, of being wrong, um, I just didn't see that from our city leadership. They did not come out and step up to the plate and say and, uh, 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 and address people like what Kim says, before the vaccine actually became available, they didn't send a preliminary message as to their their endorsement of these vaccines. We just didn't hear from them, okay, un until some ruffling or noise was made, but that's not the time. The time is, um, even though the governor had a lot of control of this, we look to our city leaders to speak for us because we don't have access to the governor and or other uh, political, uh, uh, advocate, political uh, individuals uh, legislators and so on, so on. So a lot of them don't have access to that. And so we expect our local people to speak on behalf of us locally to our state leadership. And uh, because we contribute to our state monies and our state well-being just because of who we are. So I, I really felt a little bit slighted when it came down to uh, what I what I got from uh, or did not get from some of our city leaders. The last thing is, and I got to say it, is one of the reasons that there is, uh, um, and, I, and I forgot to mention it, uh, but Jeff did somewhat, we have no one over at the health department providing local leadership in terms of a medical director. We haven't had anybody there for three years, three years. And uh, they can't get anybody because they really want to underpay that position. I'm not advocating for people to make more money, but you know that is a very important position position for us to be so stingy with funds to help uh, uh, improve the health in Duval County. Those people that are smart, those are that are, are thinkers. You know, I have several people on this line that are excellent in terms of their leadership and that have have been in that position. And for one reason or another, they're no longer in that position, but they can tell you the thought intensity and the, dev the devotedness that they had in terms of, um, of uh, uh, filling that position and the work that it required for it. And we really need, if we can have anything to say about it, get us a, a, a more 
a captain to steer that ship because that they do not have a captain right there right now. Maybe a first mate, but no captain to steer that ship. And we really need to get someone on board to help steer us locally. Okay, thank you guys. Um, my next question kind of piggybacks off of what Councilman Morgan was saying about um, local organizations and getting people involved. Uh, just simply setting up vaccination sites in minority neighborhoods without outreach and partnering with local organizations isn't enough. Uh, we have seen the success of the Edward Waters College partnership with clergy, resulting in them meeting their daily vaccination goal. However, this is not the case for many other vaccination sites. What has been done to spread awareness and other, what, what has been done to spread awareness and to create partnerships to those organizations such as churches and community centers? So am I the only one left on? That's what it looks like. <laughs> Everybody's <laughs> running. You, you said this was six to seven. seven. <laughs> That's scriptural. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, that's okay. Um, I, I truly understand that uh, question because I am one of those that always believes that you have to have great partners and when you work together, then you can accomplish many things. Um, as you know, this has really been driven by our mayor, uh, by our governor. It, it really hasn't been driven so much by city council. It, it really has been an executive kind of situation through COVID. I mean, from the start of it one year ago, uh, definitely driven by uh, the executive uh, office. So you are so right. And I think that um, even though I thought I was doing things, I, I believe that listening tonight, I can see where the outcry is that we still need to do more. There's still so much work to be done. And I believe that having Mr. Salem on tonight was great because he's, he's in the industry, he, he gets it. And just him being here said a lot. That said a lot to me. So, um, I'm gonna be working with Mr. Salem, number one, and some of my colleagues to see exactly how we come together with your organization and, and work to be partners rather than adversaries. And um, one group believing that the other group is not doing what we need to do. I think if we do it together, then we'll alleviate many of the the things that I was talking about, you know, people mistrusting and, and feeling like, no, I'm not going to do this. I mean, it's just like you said, when you're talking to people, of course, I tell people, go get your shot. Have you gotten your shot yet? Okay. Ask my husband how many times we had to ask him about his shot. So it is, um, it is definitely something that we have to talk about because when more we talk about it with our constituents and, you know, whether I put it on my Facebook, you know, go get your shots, such and such as it's here, it's there, it's all, all around town, it's, it's wherever you are. We all have to do that. And we have to make that concerted effort to make sure that we're doing it every single day. And believe me, it is on my lips every single day about the COVID shot. And just like you, I'm waiting till we get over this thing where it's a, a certain age. And, um, you know, again, I, I've learned so much tonight that I'm really ready to go out and be a different kind of advocate. So I will tell you, thank you for that. Thank okay. you. We're ready to assist anytime you get ready. Okay. Okay. Would anyone else like to respond? Cool beans. <laughs> uh, in essence of time, um, I'm going to go ahead and ask a last question. In recent years, healthcare access has dropped in communities of color, and this issue has only been exacerbated by the COVID-19 pandemic with patients missing preventative care appointments. 
with medical offices moving out of minority dominated areas and healthcare access becoming a hindrance and even unattainable for some, in order to reduce the health equity gap in the city, what plans are in place to ensure that Jacksonville residents can easily see their healthcare providers even after the pandemic has ended? Okay, that's over my head. Somebody else take it. Well, I mean, uh, I, I can address it. Um, and the only thing that, well, I got to give you a little historical background uh, to help to, to be able to address this. We, you know, Jacksonville Northside for many years was being labeled as the side that only thing that was there was Medicaid and people that didn't have insurance and so on and so on. And, um, and, that, and obviously, just like I showed on the uh, some of the charts earlier this evening, because it was so, so much, uh, so many African Americans uh, or people of color on that side of town. Problem was not that, because we had a whole lot of blue collar workers. We had some white collar workers and blue collar workers. They had good insurance. It was just that the the systems, the hospital systems, did not see that. And as more and more of healthcare becomes system oriented and less independent practitioners, you probably are seeing fewer and fewer, uh, uh, in one sense, fewer and fewer doctor's offices that are available to that community. And then in another sense, you see more as, as far as it, it relates to system related um, entities. And because I guess because of the whole advance in IT and uh, everything else that we have um, as it relates to um, technology. Um, some people, you know, particularly younger folks, don't need to be in doctor's offices, don't need to see doctors. But then we still have those older generations. And I think I told somebody the other day when they were talking about generation X, Y, Z, whatever, I was just generation old for generation old. Uh, and I have a whole bunch of generation old patients. And that generation want to see their doctors, want to talk to their doctors. They, they want access to them. And they're the ones that probably are costing us the most monies. Um, even though I see some of these young folks because they don't take care of themselves as well, quickly become members of that generation O. Um, there is not a whole lot being done to increase access in some of these communities. The only real increase in access we're seeing is by way of technology. Telemedicine uh, being the primary source by which there has been access to these doctors is convenient for some patients and is convenient for some doctors. But it is not the thing that when you actually have to look at a patient and interview a patient and touch that patient uh, and talk with them and look them in the eye and see what it is that they're trying to convey to you. Sometimes they're not telling the truth. Sometimes there's hesitancy. You know, you never know who's in the background listening so that they can't tell you that they're being abused or whatever. So sometimes you have to look at those patients, but because of technology, I think we're moving more toward uh, telemedicine and um, artificial intelligence playing a big role in terms of the way medicine go. Not saying anything wrong with it, but it's just to address your issue in terms of more doctor's offices being open in the community. Uh, anybody else that uh, uh, would like to join in, um, maybe members of the uh, uh, insurance community or, and or uh, those that uh, also practice in the community may want to join in. Before the um, Dr. Tricewell, sisters of mine, join <laughs> and take us home with this. I'd just like to just share some data as we talked about telemedicine and how we pivoted in the space. I think it's important to recognize that while we're still collecting the emerging data one year later, that we are learning that a couple of things that didn't happen with telemedicine. We are learning that uh, because of the pandemic and obviously our safety precautions, many people did not get their screening uh, in the same percentages that they did for col colorectal cancer screening, breast cancer screening, cervical cancer screening. We're concerned about that as a primary care community, as a 
family physician in particular, screening is important, primary care is important. So we need to, to figure out what are we gonna to do to kind of catch up from that. And when we look at those who are accessing health, we recognize that those with public insurance and those who, um, had uh, who were over 65 uh, were less likely to access things like telemedicine for different reasons. The reasons are still being sort sorted out. If they did not access in-person medicine and they weren't accessing telemedicine, they were accessing nothing. So we have a community of people, those with public insurance, and not uninsured, public insurance, and those who are over 65, and that's what the data shows. So we need to kind of understand that we're taking that group with us as we look at the demographics and those you know, who are smarter than me in the insurance industry area and like Dr. Kelly Trice Wells and, and those who have served the public like Jocelyn and, and know all the buzzwords and all the ways to get these campaigns going. But if you, know, if you look at just politics, just pure politics, I mean, I can't remember a minute of television in October where there wasn't some political commercial on television about something, moving people to ask us to vote. Um, and it, it did what it was supposed to do. We don't have that same kind of campaign for COVID or for, for getting screening in, in this town at least. So I think that while we can employ what we want to employ when we want to employ it, um, we have to one, use the data. I'm a research scientist first uh, as a career, a family physician by heart. We need to keep an eye on the data. We need to use the data to interpret it based on our community and our needs. And what we know is that public insurance, people are in trouble those who aren't accessing telemedicine are in, in trouble. And even though we are not, we can use telemedicine as a reason to move physically out of the community, we're still left with them not accessing that, that modem uh, for care. So we need to be careful and cautious. So in, in the interest of time, you know, I, I, this has been a good conversation and, and um, my perspective is one of, you know, having had an almost 20 year career in public health um, where I held positions both at the, the county level, but also at the state level. Um, and now am, you know, I've crossed to the other side and, and I'm on the payer side. And, and I think the, the, um, the same things are true um, that, you know, that were true when I was a health officer. Um, and that is that solutions to things like this have to be collaborative in nature, number one, and they have to solve for the most difficult pieces first. So there are some components to a strategy to address health disparities that begin and really end with solving it for the most vulnerable and the most disadvantaged first, right? If we can solution for the members of our community with lowest health literacy and limited access, then it is solved for those with means. Um, and, and it is that sort of approach that allows us to ensure that we meet the needs, again, of those that are at, mo at highest risk first, right? It can't be at added on. I think the problem, one, one of the fundamental problems is that the language necessary for all of us to, to move and address uh, health, uh, health inequities is is really not available at all. You know, every not everyone understands this space, and um, and and don't necessarily uh, equate what we are calling equity with um, uh, a need to change how systems and services are created, um, planned, and then um, operationalized. So. You know, I love the 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 um, the organization that's now been created and the work that's being done and led by um, Drs. Kane and, and Goldhagen, uh, because the collaborative nature of that work is fundamental to some of these solutions. Um, I've heard a lot of things that I think will will advance this, but you, you know, we we can't do it without, for instance, engaging those with expertise in the areas of marketing and communication and message creation. Right. What I know from, you know, as a family physician who has taken care of patients for years, I know how to provide information in a way that allows folks to take it, use it, apply it to their lives. But I'm one person. Um, we need the ability to duplicate and amplify that messaging and make it meaningful for, for folks right where they live. And perhaps that requires the engagement of the right partner. Um, some of the things I heard discussed, like the, you know, single sign-on, sort of the collective communication between social advocacy groups, those are ideas that have been discussed and, you know, um, 
now I guess are being advanced, but have been discussed for you know, at least a decade that I've been aware of. Um, and so getting on the same page with the same level of commitment to solving this in a way that again, meets the needs of the most vulnerable first is really the critical piece. Right, the, the measure of a community is how well it takes care of its most vulnerable. And as we've talked year over year about the infant mortality rates and all of the disparities that have been perpetuated in our communities, right, we're just kicking the can down the road until we're ready to sit around the table collectively, payers, public officials, um, health policy experts, you know, you know, governmental agencies, social service organizations, community advocates, and really build a comprehensive solution. And I think, you know, shame on us if the door that COVID, COVID has opened for us doesn't um, prompt us to, to move to that action step, right? You know, let's end the dialogue and let's figure out what it needs to look like. Look left, look right, who's not at the table and let's really begin to craft, not just a, a COVID solution, but a, a, a health solution for our community. We've got families who have experienced such loss will be dealing with impacts of trauma in our pediatric population for years to come. You know, we've got people displaced. We've got, you know, cancers that didn't get found this year that still exist. We've got folks who are completing their strokes and heart attacks at home because they're so fearful about how to access care. And that, is, that leaves a blemish on our community. And we know that it, it that, that the communities of color are gonna bear, you know, the, the largest evidence of that. So I'm happy about the conversation. And I think, you know, one thing that I've learned is if you're not uncomfortable in the conversation, you're not talking about the right stuff, right? So here we are. Thank you, Councilman Morgan, for being with us. Um, and being and, with us. <laughs> yeah, for being, staying with us, because this is where it begins. Um, so again, I, I'm grateful to have had the opportunity to contribute to the conversation and, and it would be an honor to do to work in any capacity to continue to advance this work. And Councilman Morgan, let me add my thanks as well for um, not only being with us now, but for have been with been with us. And that sustainability speaks louder um, than a lot of things. So thank you very much. Absolutely. And thank you all. You know, it's it's good to see the faces that I've known for many years as well. So it, it's good to know that we're all still doing the same kind of work. It, it doesn't go away. And um, you always show the same stripes, right? <laughs> They're the same no matter what. So um, this has been a great conversation. And, uh, you know, I look forward to the next one and how we get moving. I just got a message from uh, Impact Church. And of course, Impact Church is actually located now at Regency Square Mall. So it's really kind of interesting, but they are actually gonna be a COVID site. I, I got a message that Bethel is going to be a, a COVID site. So again, we're moving in the right direction, but um, it, it, it bears to reason that there are certain sites that will attract a lot of minorities and those are the sites it's it's the church and we'll have so many people come to bethel we'll have so many people come to impact and it's a comfort level you know it really is a comfort level and that that is why they will go because they're talking to their pastors, they're talking to their other church members, they're feeling more comfortable. And that's how we get people to come out. It, it is, as we've always said, in, in politics, I learned one thing that's knocking on doors. You really have to do just ground, do the ground game. You gotta go straight to the people where they are and uh, bring them in like that. So again, thank you all so much. Um, We'll continue and we'll continue to work hard. Well, we're, we're just about um, at 721 and I did wanna give a little bit of time for uh, Dr. Danford to give some closing remarks. But before we did that, and cause I had to step away. So um, I've stepped in and I just wanted to thank uh, uh, the council persons that came and particularly the heartfelt um, really revelations from these leaders um, and particularly 
uh, Drs. Johnson, Wells, and uh, Kane for really laying it on the line that we really have to stop messing around. We've got to we've got to do the right thing and move forward and and to have uh, Councilwoman Morgan step up and say and say that she realizes more must be done. We're not just talking about COVID. We're talking about so many other things that need to be taken care of. And I like the, the comment that uh, Dr. Wells made, that if we focus on those issues for this community, mm -hmm. the, the whole world will benefit. You know, um, the people that are um, wealthier will end up benefiting because they too will see that if people care about one another in one community, it can make their community better. So I just wanna thank all of you for that. And with that, I'll ask, uh, I, I, I did look at the questions. Uh, uh, there was one comment um, uh, from um, uh, actually uh, Jocelyn Turner, who um, has been very active with us in uh, many of these uh, webinars. And she just came from another one with Hispanics and raised just, I'll just raise the point so it's not lost. And that is there, there will be a growing number of people uh, in the Hispanic community who will be afraid to step forward because of identification. And we have to keep that in mind, but let's save that for another meeting and, and, uh, um, and uh, let people um, get home to their families. So Richard, would you mind, um, Closing this out. Oh, go ahead. Oh, Richard, get on. I just want to thank everybody for the participation. I called in a lot. Uh, my, uh, I don't want to say backup crew, but my uh, riding partners, <laughs> Dr. Uh, Kelly Trice Wells and, and Dr. Kim Barbell Johnson, they're, the, they're my ride and die partners when it comes down to advocacy for the community. And so I want to thank them for uh, jumping in in such a late date and late time frame. Uh, they, they meant everything that they said. I want to thank uh, Councilman Morgan for stepping up to the plate and, uh, and, that, and, and we'll assure her that whatever we can do, both uh, as individuals and as the medical society, we you know, uh, may not have had many on the, uh, uh, the call, but that's because we have so many <laughs> that so many of these calls. So, but we, you got the full force of us behind you, but whatever you need that we can provide, we're willing to step up to the plate and do just that. And to thank the other, the interns, externs, thank those guys for uh, putting on such a great program. They worked hard and did it for free. So I really want to thank them <laughs> for their uh, participation in this. So uh, with that, I'm done. Thank you. Thank everybody. you. And thank you, Kaziah, Hunter, Erica, Jocelyn, Mora, and Anna Yates, and all the other interns that have been helping us this semester. We really appreciate it. And uh, so take it away, Richard. Sure. Uh, kudos to our interns. And, you know, it was, uh, I really enjoyed the conversation this evening. And what uh, one of the takeaways is how extremely important communication is. And what we're finding is oftentimes in our communities, we are, uh, we, we really don't receive the, 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 the level of communication, the time of communication that we need in order to help our constituents uh, make those uh, decisions that will help uh, improve their quality of life. So as, um, uh, as we move forward as an organization, the Urban League, I'm pleased with uh, how, we've, uh, how we've participated in bringing um, uh, some of our organizations together, like-minded organizations, as we focus on some of these critical issues. So uh, it's encouraging to, to have uh, our city council, uh, any of our city council members to participate with us. Uh, I know that they are all busy, but uh, this is very important. This is extremely important to us. And I know that because of our advocacy, over the, over the last few months that uh, uh, our issues 
uh, were elevated to a level that we, uh, we, 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 I mean, we can see the positive benefits from your efforts uh, advocating for these communities to have access. And so we feel strongly that community engagement is so important in this community and we will continue to work uh, certainly uh, at the Urban League, certainly at the Center for Advocacy and Social Justice. And we've, uh, we've got to continue to, 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 to move the cheese. It's, it's difficult work, but uh, let's not give up and let's support uh, those who are working in this, uh, in this field. So thank you all very much for joining us. Uh, we look forward to our next uh, town hall. Thank you, Dennis. Oh, thank you, everyone. You have a great evening and uh, really appreciate the sharing. And just keep in mind that minorities do make up 40% of the voters, uh, Councilman Morgan. So maybe you need to tell your, <laughs> your, your colleague. Uh, let's, not, let's not go there. Let's not go there, Roger. Okay? Yeah. No, no, no. She's fine. That, that, that's where I'm going now. She's doing well. Oh, okay. <laughs> yeah, she's doing well. It's our colleagues that might need to know that. Okay. Oh, and by the way, uh, kudos to uh, Jocelyn Turner with for the green. Oh, yeah. she's I'm the Irish blood in me, so happy St. Patrick's Day, everyone. <laughs> Bye. What about, what, Thank you. Bye. Okay, Bye. 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 <laughs>